Welcome to Unfiltered with David Kaplan. I'm Lawrence Holmes, and I'm in for Cap tonight. We are at Bulls Fest here right outside the United Center. It's a great event. It's going to be an awesome weekend. On the show, we are going to talk Bulls with Casey Johnson and Chuck Swirsky. And big series for the White Sox tonight. You know why? Because they need to get some wins against the Minnesota Twins. Chuck Garfine is going to help us out with all of that. It is unfiltered. I am Lawrence Holmes, and it starts right now. Here are tonight's top stories brought to you by Four Seasons Heating, Air Conditioning, Plumbing, and Electric. Bears president and CEO Ted Phillips has announced that he plans to retire after the 2022-23 season. The White Sox open a crucial three-game series tonight against Minnesota as they sit four games back at Cleveland. Serena Williams will play in the third round tonight, looking to extend her farewell tour at Arthur Ashe Stadium at the U.S. Open. And the college football playoff will expand to 12 teams by 2026 after the board of managers approved it earlier today. It's time now to go on the beat. Welcome in the Bulls Insider from DCSportsChicago.com, Casey Johnson, and the radio voice of the Bulls, Chuck Swirsky. Gentlemen, it is great to see you both out here at Bulls Fan Fest. You guys have both been observers of the Bulls for a long time. So what's it like to see something like this connected with the franchise? Well, first and foremost, Lawrence, great to see you. Great to see KC. I think it's fantastic. Young people out here playing, hooping. I love it. Uh, it reminds me of Shoot the Bull. You guys remember Shoot the Bull? Yes. Is, that's the, the seeds of this event, I'm told, by uh, a guest you're going to have later on in the show, back to the street ball tournament. I know it's broad and past that with some arts and crafts and some music events, but at the court, still hoops and three-on-three, three, so you got to love it. You still shoot, KC? You're going to come out come here on, and man. play? I could bust my teenage boys all day long, baby. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. you got to let them know. Don't let the suit fool you. I'm overdressed, <laughs> but un underdressed, I can I can still destroy yeah. those guys. So that's where it's at. That's where where it's at well there was some seismic news in the nba especially for the bulls considering that donovan mitchell is now a cleveland cavalier casey how did this come about and what do you think it means for the central the east and for the bulls well, obviously, when you add a player of the talent of Donovan Mitchell, who's a three-time All-Star and is about to turn 26 uh, to a core that's already got young talent in Darius Garland, Evan Mob Mobley, and uh, Jared Allen, you've got a potential uh, franchise cornerstone for years to come. I mean, you've got cost control on those guys. It's all young talent. Obviously, there was a breakdown with the Knicks talks, and the Cavaliers were lurking quietly in the background, and they swooped in. They paid a high price. You got to give Danny Ainge credit for what he's doing and what he's what he's been able to get for Rudy Gobert and now Donovan Mitchell as they enter a full rebuild. But the Cavaliers aren't going to be going away for a while. They've obviously got to prove it on the court, but they've got a lot of young talent. Chuck, what do you see when you see that deal being made by Cleveland? Well, it was only a matter of time. We knew that he was going to get dealt, Lawrence. Here's the thing, and I know it's boring. I know it is boring to say <laughs> this, but it was a good trade for both teams. I agree. And I'll, I'll tell you what, Utah. In a major rebuild, they're doing it the right way. No question about it. All right, so we are here at Bulls Fan Fest. So why don't let's talk about where the Bulls stand right now. It was an interesting offseason. A lot of people thought that there may be a little bit more that the Bulls are going to do. Casey, how would you describe what the Bulls accomplished this offseason? Well, I think some people are forgetting the, the one item of this business that they accomplished was they re-signed Zach Levine. <laughs> I mean, Very important. I mean, it sounds, uh, you know, okay, yes, they paid him a max salary, and yes, uh, they, they were able to pay him more than the other team, but still, they retained a two-time All-Star who was entering his prime. So when people say they didn't do a lot, they did a lot. They re-signed Zach Levine. Now, they told us they were going to be working the margins, and that's what they did with adding Andre Drummond, Goran Dragic. Um, you know, whether it's right or wrong, we're going to see how it plays out this season. But management's been hammering this theme of continuity, letting the core build together since they stood pat at the trade deadline. And obviously, if they get improved health and a rejuvenated Zach Levine off that scope, they have a chance to do some damage in the East. Chuck, what was it like for you to sit there and, and call Zach Levine playing in a playoff series? Like that, It felt like a very important milestone for his career. It, it was. Obviously, Lawrence, from the standpoint – for Levine's career, I think re-signing, as Casey mentioned, sent a ripple effect, not only within the organization, that, you know what, he wants to be here, all right? And the Bulls wanted him here. From day one, our tourists and Mark said, this is a priority, to get Zach Levine back in Chicago. 
they delivered. And Levine has grown as a player. I, I, I saw him play at UCLA that one year. He's from Bothell High School, east side of Seattle. I know gotta you know it. He's always got to drop the Seattle. Got to get the 206 and props. But having said all this, I do agree that you put in little pieces here and there with Drummond eating minutes in the post. Dragic, even at the age of 37, can still deliver 12, 15 minutes a night, however they're going to play him. And don't sleep on Dale and Terry. I love this kid. I love his motor. I love his wingspan as far as deflections, his defense. I think this was a great first-round pick. I've been asking this question of anyone that I can find that's around the Bulls. And since I got two Bulls experts here, I'm going to ask you this question. I know how hard DeMar DeRozan works. He he clearly loves this game. And what he brought to the Bulls last year was, was unimaginable, except for, for him. He imagined it, but no one else really imagined it. I keep looking at the numbers, and I know that Kobe was one of his guys. And at the end of Kobe's career, we saw an uptick in three-point attempts. I'm wondering, is that something that DeMar could do, considering he is Mr. Long, too, could he add more three-point shots per game? Okay, I'll take it. I mean, you saw a little bit of that, Lawrence, last season. I think it's a fantastic analogy you're drawing. Um, and he's he is kind of like that student of the game that always kind of tries to add a new wrinkle to his game. Obviously, you saw with Michael adding the mid-post game at the end of his career. You saw with Kobe extending the, to the three-point line. DeMar's uh, three-point percentage was as high as it's been all season last year. His attempts went up just slightly. I'm not saying it's, he's going to come out and start gunning, but I can see that as he evolves into the later stages of his career, him emphasizing that shot a little bit more. Yeah, you know what, Lawrence and Casey? I want DeMar to be DeMar. I can live with that. I love it. Because DeMar DeRozan, in my opinion, he's going to the Hall of Fame one day. And For sure. He is. There is no question about it. I think this year in a major, major American market like Chicago cemented that. Having said all this, I think another wrinkle – and another chapter that we need to talk about is player development. This has been a priority from our Arturis, along with Mark Eversley, the moment they arrive with Billy Donovan, player development. I think you're going to see a guy like Kyle. You're going to see Patrick Williams. You're going to see the development of a young player like Dale and Terry. All these young kids that are coming up, including a guy like Javante Green, I think their games are going to get better. Casey, this has been something that I've been talking about on the radio show for the last few days. What's the latest on Lonzo Ball? Uh, I want to make clear I, I, uh, I'm not aggregated here. Or it doesn't turn into a headline because <laughs> it's a fluid situation, right? Yes, and, it is. And here's the thing. We didn't think we'd be talking about this uh, when that injury happened in January. Remember, we were told Correct. six to eight weeks. So the fact that we're still talking about it in September reminds you and underscores how much of a fluid situation it is. What I will say is the negativity that or, or the not negativity, the pessimism, the kind of the the more pessimistic outlook that I was hearing earlier in the offseason has now started to move towards a little bit of the optimistic side. It seems like things are trending the right direction. What that means in terms of is he there for the first uh, practice of training camp? Is he there for opening night? I cannot answer those questions. What I can answer is that the progress seems to be linear at this point, and it seems to be trending in the right direction. Well, let's take a look at the tip of the cap, which is powered by points bet. After the Cavs traded for Donovan Mitchell, the odds makers adjusted Cleveland's chances of winning drastically. The Cavs are now the second favorite to win the Central Division behind Milwaukee at three to one. Wow. The Bulls are eight to one to win. And look at the win totals. Cleveland is now at 48 and a half, five games better than the Bulls at 43 and a half. Gentlemen, it was my absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you both about all sorts of stuff. Chicago Bulls, Casey out here making us look bad. You know, how do you get the memo? We're, we're out here casual, doing it casual. He's doing the best he can. We both thank you very much for, for being a part of the show. Time for our first break here on Unfiltered. We'll discuss what's happening here throughout the holiday weekend with the Bulls. We'll meet the players, the lovables, Will Purdue, Kendall Gill. We'll discuss all of it coming up next.
Fest will take place this weekend here at the United Center. All kinds of entertainment. You have the three-on-three -three hoops, you got live music, food trucks, and the chance to meet Dalen Terry and Ayo Tasumu, as well as our guys, Kendall Gill and Will Purdue, and other former Bulls. We welcome to the show Dan Moriarty, who is the VP of Marketing for the Chicago Bulls. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. What made the Bulls want to do a fan festival like this? Awesome. Thank you for having us on. Uh, we're excited to talk about Bulls Fest. Um, so we've thought about uh, why we would do Bulls Fest or the idea of Bulls Fest for a number of years now. So people that have lived in Chicago may remember um, back in the 90s, we used to have Shoot the Ball, which was a big three-on-three -three tournament in Grant Park. Uh, as an organization, we've talked about that a lot and wanting to do something like that again, but we've wanted to kind of modernize it and make it feel a bit more like our brand uh, as our brand is today. Um, and so as, as we came out of COVID and as we started talking about, okay, what can we do to really, you know, re-engage our fan base and kind of do something fun for them going into the start of this season, the idea for Bulls Fest came out, which was part basketball fest, part basketball three-on-three -three tournament, part Chicago Street Festival, part celebration of the Chicago Bulls brand. Um, and so really for us, it's a combination of those three factors um, combined with, um, you know, Chicago's love of doing things outdoors in the summer. It looks great. Everyone is having such a good time. How much time goes into putting something like this together? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of time. So we we probably, we've talked about it for a number of years. We got serious about it uh, in September and then kind of as an organization decided that we were committing to it in January. So pretty much January through now has been a lot of work. While we were in season, it was maybe, you know, it was, it was a solid chunk of work, but not massive. But pretty much since May, there's been... 15 of us almost full time on this and then probably 40 to 50 people internally that have been doing something on this. Uh, so a large chunk of the organization spent a large chunk of their summer trying to bring this to life. For the Bulls fan that's sitting at home right now is like, wait, you guys are doing a, a Bulls fest? What can they do to come be a part of this and what can they expect when they come out this weekend? Yeah, absolutely. So the way we described it is, is Bulls fest is hoops, arts, beats and eats. So hoops is basketball, celebration of all things basketball. So we've got a three on three tournament. We have kids clinics, we have a slam dunk contest, we have a three-point contest, which is open qualification. So any fans that always say they could win a three-point contest can come down and actually try. Uh, we have photo opportunities with current players, former players. Arturis and Mark Eversley are both going to be out there really trying to uh, you know, bring the connection between the current basketball operations and our fan base. Um, arts is we've got over 100 artists from all over the world that are exhibiting unique pieces of work that they've designed exclusively for this festival. Beats is obviously music. We've got a full entertainment schedule Saturday and Sunday. We've got... And uh, you kept it super Chicago with G Herbo and DeBrat, Debrat, right? We got DeBrat headlining Saturday. We've got G Herbo headlining Sunday, as well as a whole bunch of band and entertainment that you're used to seeing at Chicago Street Festivals. And when you come to the United Center, the Bulls games, we've got the Lover Bulls, we've got the 312 crew, we've got Benny the Bull. And then Eats is obviously, you can't have a Chicago Street Festival without good food and good drinks. So we've got food trucks lining up and down Madison. We've got the United Center concessions open. And we've got a whole bunch of stuff happening out in Lot C, uh, bringing food and beverage to life. What's the hope for the Bulls as an organization with this to kind of kickstart to get ready for the regular season? Yeah, so, you know, for us, when we when we looked at doing this, we thought the time of year is great, right? Like, it's typically a semi-quiet time of year for us. Fans are starting to get excited, but we're not quite there yet. You know, we're not quite back uh, with training camp and preseason. Um, so the hope is, you know, really, we get some fans out. They have a good time. They enjoy themselves. They give us some feedback around what they like, what they didn't like. The hope is that this becomes an annual event, that this is something where 
fans have such a good time. We as a business have such a good time. We want to keep doing it year over year. Uh, but we want to hear from fans. We, we want fans to tell us if they like this, they didn't like this. We'll do more of the stuff they like. We'll do less of the stuff they don't. And we'll go from there. Dan, thank you so much for joining Fantastic. us. We really appreciate it. This is going to be a great event for all Bulls fans that want to come out and be a part of it. Dan Moriarty, the vice president of marketing for the Chicago Bulls. We need to take another time out. We're going to take a look at the White Sox, who start a huge series with the Twins tonight. Chuck Garfine joins us next on Unfiltered. time it's the White Sox beat. The White Sox are starting a huge series against the Minnesota Twins tonight. So our guy Chuck Garfine is here with us to discuss. Chuck, thanks for joining us. A little bit of a shake up here at the start of this. What happened with the White Sox lineup? Oh, yeah, are we talking about the, the injuries and uh, we got Luis Robert on the paternity list, Aloy Jimenez, his uh, leg is still bothering him so he's not playing today. He might be available to pinch hit. Uh, he will probably be a DH potentially going forward for the rest of the season. Miguel Cairo, the interim manager, uh, mentioned that today. Uh, you got Leary Garcia in left field. Mark Payton was brought up for the minor leagues, but he's not starting. He could have been in left. So, yeah, this is a big series. Like I said, there are four games behind the Guardians for first place. And yet in this series, we're certainly in this game to start the series. Obviously, no Tim Anderson, no Yoan Mankata, no Aloy Jimenez. No Luis Robert, but this is what the situation the White Sox are in right now. We'll see what they can do. Speaking of starters, Chuck, are, are we seeing a bullpen game for the White Sox tonight? I know. The surprises continue. We thought it was going to be uh, uh, Davis Martin starting. It turns out Joe Kelly is going to be an opener here tonight. Uh, they really feel confident with Joe Kelly on the mound against those top three hitters in the lineup for the Twins to get things started. Luis Arise leads off. He's batting 395 against the Sox this year. So it's Joe Kelly. And then we think it likely, I'll say likely, probably, might be Davis Martin after that. He'll go a few innings, I guess. But, you know, when you when you start a game with a uh, an opener, it's always a question about, like, what is really coming in after that? How is it all going to play out? We're going to have to wait and see. I'm so curious to see what first inning Joe Kelly looks like because it's been a struggle for him throughout the season. I wonder if having as long as he needs to warm up and maybe a couple of, of conversations with Ethan Katz beforehand might get the best version of Kelly tonight. When you look at Joe Kelly's ERA, you think this is the worst season 
any reliever can ever have. He's, he's got like a seven ERA. Uh, he has had some rough games for sure. He's also had games where like you look at him and you're like, wow, that's the Joe Kelly the White Sox thought they were getting. I hope that's the Joe Kelly we see here today. I mean, he's still throwing triple digits. Uh, he's had issues trying to stay healthy. There was a game where he felt lightheaded. There's been all sorts of stuff going on with him. He got hit by a ball, uh, ricocheted off his knee. He's starting today. Uh, we shall see what we're going to get, which Joe Kelly we get. And, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, he knows exactly. He knew, I guess, a few hours ago or at some point before uh, first pitch that he was definitely starting this game. So uh, that'll be I'll be interested to see. And, listen, the Sox have had a tough time getting out the top three hitters in that lineup. Now there's no Byron Buxton, but there's Carlos Correa, obviously, and Luis Arise. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to see how this is all going to play out here today with Kelly and just going forward in this game. I, I mean, I know he's going short innings. You're not planning on him being out there for four right. or five, but – the 10-13 ERA against the Twins is is it's definitely a choice that that Miguel Cairo is making. So here's hoping it works out for him, right? Yeah, I mean, you can always look at the numbers, and I haven't looked at all the game logs of Kelly and how many games he's pitched against the Twins. So when you have a a reliever have one bad game against a team, or even it just your ERA just explodes. So. Uh, I haven't dived into just every game he's had against them. Uh, he's been up and down. This is a big series. Would you? Would I say it's a little bit of a risk, a little of a bit of a gamble to start the game like this? Yes, I would. But I'm not going to define it yet. I'm going to be watching this game and watching this inning going, all right, this is very, very interesting. We're going to have a lot to talk about on the postgame show and the pregame show as well. Frank Thomas is going to join me next. <laughs> Earlier on my radio show today with Dan, we had Gavin Sheets on. He's been one of the real success stories for the White Sox and player development this year. The guy that he's been since he's come back from the minors has been awesome. It seems like that's exactly what they've needed, Chuck, like a little left side thump to kind of balance that lineup out. Well, this is what they thought they were getting, or at least hoping they were going to get at the start of the season because when we saw Gavin Sheets last year, and it's tough to predict, anticipate how a player will develop. You hope, oh, he's a rookie in 2021. He'll just be better in 2022 right, off the, right out of the gate. That wasn't the case. They were hoping they were going to get this kind of production from the get-go. They didn't get it, and he had to go down to the minor leagues found something there, got his confidence back, tweaked something, a little something with his swing, and now we're seeing the Gavin Sheets that we were hoping we were going to get at the start of the year. So uh, that has been a, a great bright spot for them. This is a team that does not have a lot of left-handed hitting. This is a team that does not have to do great against right-handed pitching. So uh, what they're getting out of uh, Gavin Sheets right now has been huge. He's batting cleanup tonight that shows you the kind of production he's been getting uh, giving this White Sox team lately obviously we all want to see the White Sox win some games it's more fun usually for you when the White Sox win games but I gotta tell you as someone who loves the pre and post game show I feel like you and Ozzy and Pods and Frank this past week have had so much fun in the face of adversity. So what what's it like to be in the room with those guys, even when you have to have the tough conversations about things going wrong with the White Sox? Yeah, I mean, we're just trying to tell it like it is. And we're trying to be fair. We want to be fair. We don't ever make things personal with the, the players, because we, especially former players, they know what it's like to take that field uh, day after day after day after day. This, But we feel like we've been fair because... Not everyone was saying World Series or bust, but basically this was a team put together to win a World Series. They have struggled to be above 500 this year. You have to call a spade a spade at some point, and some point became uh, late July, <laughs> August, and it's time for this team to show up and be the team or be something close to the team that we thought we thought they'd be, they thought they would be, and so... You know, Ozzy, Frank, Pods, Gordon Beckham and I, 
we're just kind of being like what we're, we're thinking and saying what fans are thinking and saying, and this team has not met expectations. Hopefully that changes and changes fast. That is the hope. So hopefully we see happy Chuck tonight on the post game <laughs> yeah. instead of salty Chuck. Although I, I'm, I'm kind of fond of salty Chuck. Chuck Garfine, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being a part of Unfiltered. Yeah, salty Chuck is better television, but I'd rather be happy Chuck. Time for our stat of the day, which is brought to you by Aiken Law. The White Sox hit seven homers in their three-game series against Kansas City. And for the first time this season, they hit multiple home runs in three straight games. This from our Chris Kampka, truly stunning. Let's see if that trend continues tonight. Which brings us to capping it off, which is driven by Sheffield. The White Sox have had all sorts of meetings throughout the year. They've had Kenny Williams talk to the team. They've had other people step in and talk to the team. They've talked to each other, including a players meeting earlier this week. With there being 31 games left in the schedule, what would it look like if the White Sox played hard for 31 games? Everything has been leading up to keeping guys fresh until September. Well, now the run is here, and now the opportunity is in front of you. The Twins are sitting in front of you in the standings, and you got them coming to your place, which is great. It's been a rough week for the White Sox, obviously, with Tony La Russa not being with the team, but they still have an opportunity. Here's hoping that everything that is built up to this team resting until this point now allows them to kick it into overdrive in the last 31 games. We thank you so much to everyone here at the Chicago Bulls, everyone at NBC Sports Chicago, everyone here at the Fan Fest. Have a wonderful and safe holiday weekend.